Paul represented us all well yesterday at the Interfaith Symposium Safety and Security, and he presented on the work we've been doing in terms of violence prevention, preparation, intervention, and healing. Look at that. I'm getting the four pillars down. It only takes me a couple months. Anyway, <laughs> Paul did the presentation and um, you know, we, th that would be another come back again uh, to the intersection and having presentations like that, that different collaboratives have done and then just present it at the intersection because it's another good update because this collaborative has come a ways since uh, it started. So, yes. In fact, Paul, why don't you tell us about was it Tuesday? You mentioned it in your presentation yesterday, but that there was, uh, and I want to watch the recording. I very much want to watch the recording, but there was some city conversation and uh, Herman Price was a part of it. You mentioned it at the end of your presentation yesterday. Do you remember what I'm talking about? <laughs> there was some conversation in the city. I need to close these blinds. Do you see that? Do you remember what I'm talking about? Come on, man. Well, I would say that uh, two, two things uh, I think made it uh, much uh, uh, ben benefited me greatly. One was, of course, <clears throat> the rehearsals that we went through. And a number of folks who uh, are regulars on the intersection were part of the uh, yeah, giving feedback and uh, part of that rehearsal, they sat sat through the uh, you know the kind of the agony of uh, hearing it for the first time, second, and so forth. But I'd also say that the other thing that made uh, the presentation um, um, easier for me was the day before recognizing that the group and the ideas would continue uh, beyond um, this week. Uh, and that was, that changed for me, the whole um, uh, mood of the presentation. And maybe you, and maybe, and you and others would notice that I was certainly much more upbeat. And the two of the uh, reasons that contributed to that was what happened the day before. And that was that uh, there was a meeting of the City Council Governance Committee that talked about uh, crime and crime prevention. And it was a very interesting uh, meeting. Uh, one of the councilmen um, had made a proposal about a new office that uh, the group didn't go along with, but basically they, they supported the idea of the importance of uh, of uh, uh, planning more for the in terms of the future. So that was a, a very important uh, uh, step that took place. And Erica was the one who brought that to uh, our attention. The second was a phone call that I received from uh, Judge Peter Sakai, uh, which I thought was very supportive of what it was that our uh, our collaborative was doing and that also gave me hope for the future so uh, those are, were two things that helped me in terms of my own mindset uh, before the presentation yeah it was that that meeting that governance committee thing that I was trying to remember. And maybe I'll try to get the, the link to that because all those things are recorded. And um, anyway, that was the one I was looking for. So good morning. It's two after 8 a.m. And it's good to see all of you at the intersection. Um, I see that one of yeah. our folks who are going to bring briefing, Miguel, is here. Oh, and Ruth is here with us now. This is great. Good morning, Ruth. Um, but we're going to take just a couple minutes. Um, I kind of have a feeling we might have smaller crowds as we march closer to the new year. Um, but 
uh, we're still going to keep at it. As Paul told folks, folks yesterday, at, yesterday at the Interface Symposium for Safety and Security, a lot of S's in that, um, we meet every Thursday except Thanksgiving. So, uh, and I remember our at the intersection last year, right before the new year, that, that Thursday, the last Thursday of the year, we had an amazing conversation that wasn't planned and it was so good. So that's how this is set up. You come when you can, um, you bring as many folks as you can because that's how we get the word out. The number one way that things move and spread are by word of mouth not billboards, but word of mouth. So we all do our part and invite others. Um, I'm wondering if there are any announcements. I have one that I can think of. Um, next, uh, December 21st, next Wednesday. So I had to check the day of the week. Next Wednesday is the longest night of the year. And uh, annually on that night, across the United States, but also here in San Antonio, in the park across the street from Krista Santa Rosa. Um, there is always a vigil and folks who have died without um, permanent shelter in their lives in this past year, San Antonians, they will re be remembered by name at that vigil. Um, it's one of my, um, Favorite isn't quite the right word, but uh, it's very meaningful. It's one of the most meaningful things that I think happens in the city on an annual basis. So that's next Wednesday, December 21st, 7 p.m. So maybe one or two more announcements if folks have things. We could probably spend the next, you know, 45 minutes talking about what we're all going to do. I, uh, the city offices are always closed between Christmas and New Year's. So mostly I'm just gonna dance around my house having a whole week off with very few emails coming in. So, <laughs> no, that's not true, but I have family coming in and I plan to hug my three grandchildren as much as I can. So any announcements? Good to see some folks back who I haven't seen in a bit. So welcome, Susan. Uh, and I just put in the uh, chat box that the child tax credit is expiring. And so I have a Zoom meeting with one of Senator John Carnan's assistants this afternoon at two. And if anyone would like to be in my Zoom room and express the importance of child tax credits, and it is especially the economically disadvantaged who will suffer if a uh, child tax credit is not renewed. So um, I'll put my email in the chat if you want to come to the 2 p.m. Zoom meeting with John Carnan's assistant. Would love to have friends in the Zoom room. Great, now if you had posted something before in the chat, I don't see it, Martha Ann, a link or something. So you might wanna repost it. Uh, I, I hadn't gotten as far as okay. the link. Okay. but I'm going to repost with my email address. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, several weeks ago, did somebody else have the, I heard a little squeak there. Yeah. Say really quick. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, yesterday, before I went to your meeting, Mayor Gregory and I were talking about how we could do the Christmas meeting and nobody really knew it. So I felt like the coolest person in the room was the attorney's office. So I was like, oh, you guys go use this resource. And everybody did know it. So anyway, just wanted to say that. Thank you for making me the coolest person at the state attorney's office yesterday. Thank you, Kendra. I found you very difficult to hear and understand. So you might want to post something in chat to what you had said. But thank you. So um, several weeks ago, um, through our government relations office at the city, the White House um, 
asked if we could gather together in San Antonio, oh, a couple dozen faith leaders. And um, so I kind of went through the list and invited 36 and about 20, 24 of our leaders showed up and um, it was a briefing on MPOX, also known as monkeypox. And um, I'm, I've got two folks here who know much more about it than I do, but um, they were really focusing in on how important um, to get this word out, but also to be knowledgeable. So when uh, we encounter folks or no folks, we should again spread the word that um, about what we're going to hear from Miguel, a uh, public health administrator with the city, and also uh, our own Dr. Ruth <laughs> from UT Health. And uh, I just, I, I've not met Miguel before, but I have so much respect for Ruth's work and how her feet are on the ground. And she was really working from that direction in terms of COVID. She was the lead from UT Health. And I just am grateful for all of us and Ruth, what you did in that time, still in that time, but in terms of your leadership. So I'm going to turn it over to Miguel and to Ruth, and they're going to tell us why we need to know about MPOX and what we need to know. Um, so that we can carry this information out into the community. Thank you both for being with us. Thank Miguel? you. And I just want to say that I'm here as your infectious disease consultant, and I can answer clinical infectious disease questions. I absolutely defer to my respected colleagues at Metro Health uh, for what's going on with the epidemiology and local efforts at vaccination. Now, so, Ruth, you can say you're a consultant but Ruth also knows community. And that's what we're all about at the intersection, no matter whether we're faith community or civic leaders, you know, how do we create community? How do we heal community? How are we working through community and how are we doing it together? So Miguel, teach us, inform us. All right, well, uh, thank you all for the, the invite this morning to talk a little bit about MPOX. And I will share my screen. I did have a few slides just because it's easier to show data with some visuals. Um, and I promise it's not death by PowerPoint. It's just a, a few slides here that I have prepared. So let me just share my screen. You should be quick. able to do that. The screen's open. Okay, thank you. There we go. Are you able to see the PowerPoint? We can. Perfect. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start by saying that um, MPOX is not a novel virus in the world. Uh, this is a, a virus that does is, is known to occur um, quite regularly, uh, mostly in um, Western parts, Central and Western parts of Africa. And so, but this is the first time that we've seen an outbreak of this magnitude outside of that region. Um, we've had cases before in the United States um, in the early 2000s uh, related to um, uh, pet stores um, and prairie dogs that uh, were infected uh, by um, some animals that were brought over from Africa. So we, we do have some history of, of this virus. And this virus is also very similar to, it's in the same orthopox virus as smallpox. Uh, which we already have a vaccine for. Uh, so I did want to give that brief uh, background. I, I don't want to go into too much detail because I do want to focus on uh, what we're actually seeing here in the United States in terms of MPOX. Uh, so uh, this current outbreak, we saw that it started in early May of 2022. And um, to date, uh, there have been a total of 29,646 cases reported in the United States. And the uh, number of um, cases that we've been seeing by the state are in the highest number of cases have been reported in California, New York, Texas, Florida, and Georgia. Um, and you can see here on this uh, page that the, it's showing the number of cases reported by day. Uh, so on the far left is the earliest at the beginning of the uh, outbreak and um, towards the right is more current date. So you're seeing that uh, the number of cases reported on a daily basis kind of peaked 
sometime in early August, late July. And th this is data from the United States in total. And um, towards the right, you're seeing that we're starting to see a decrease in cases. Uh, so um, in the US, we're seeing about uh, five to about five cases uh, reported in the last seven days on average. Uh, so we are seeing a smaller number of cases, which means that the work that we're doing um, is, is working and also that natural immunity is also in play here. So it, it's a mix of both uh, public health actions uh, being taken and also natural immunity. In Texas, um, what we have here, uh, this is data from the Department of State Health Services. Um, that I was able to obtain yesterday. And so uh, their data is reported by public health region. Uh, so they, they group uh, the different counties by the region. And I put it, I added the uh, main metroplex areas uh, in each region. That way you can have an idea of where these areas are. Uh, so uh, San Antonio, which is in region eight, um, is the largest metroplex in that region. And um, our, the number of cases that we're seeing here uh, fall forth in the state of Texas, um, following uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the Houston area, and um, Austin area. So we have reported 193 cases um, to DSHS, and you see that this number is different um, from the right hand of the screen, and that's because our, our case counts are reported on a weekly basis, and those will be updated tomorrow. Uh, the, the number on here is from 12-9 and DSHS's numbers. Um, also include um, counties that are outside of Bear County. So that's that's a different, these aren't just uh, Bear County numbers here in this region eight figure. So like I mentioned, um, some of the public health measures have uh, greatly impacted the trajectory of, of this outbreak. Um, and a study uh, conducted by the, um, that, that was conducted in males ages 18 to 49 years of age, um, found that those that were uh, fully vaccinated, uh, having received both doses of the current Genios vaccine, which is a vaccine that was developed for smallpox, but has been found to be effective um, for Mpox as well, uh, because of the similarity in the both viruses. So um, you see here the, this, this picture showing that um, for every illness that occurred in an individual who was fully vaccinated, uh, and this was two weeks after having received their second dose, there were 10 illnesses among individuals who were unvaccinated. Uh, so meaning showing that the vaccine was effective in preventing additional cases. And, and those that are vaccinated do have uh, protection against this virus. Uh, and the message here is that it's important to get vaccinated, but then also to complete the series uh, because there are two doses that are required to complete the series and the doses are given um, at least 28 days apart. So um, viruses don't discriminate. And the reason um, I'm saying this is because this current outbreak uh, has predominantly um, most many of the, the cases have been reported in um, men who have sex with men. However, it is important that viruses don't discriminate. And um, this outbreak is based on risk behaviors and exposures and not sexual orientation. Uh, so there are some members in the LGBT community who are at low risk uh, because of, of their behaviors um, and types of exposures, while there are some heterosexual individuals who are at higher risk of uh, becoming infected with Mpox. So what can you do and why are we here today? Um, you can help us by helping to reduce the stigma by encouraging folks uh, to seek medical attention if they have uh, symptoms that are uh, that they think may be related with Mpox uh, so that they can get screened and, and get the proper tests done um, and make people aware of the available resources. We do have the vaccine still available in Metro Health and also in the six HIV service providers in the community. Uh, so that vaccine is widely av well available in the community. Um, and we do also offer opportunities um, to try and, and do screenings outside of the um, the clinical areas in, in, out in the community, and we do uh, post that information on our website. Uh, so our website is sanantonio.gov slash health, as you see on the screen. And if you need more information or would like for us to 
um, have anyone that you would like to refer to us to have a, a more uh, specific discussion with a situation that might be occurring with them, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to uh, follow up with anyone or groups of individuals to provide additional ed education. Um, so that is all I have uh, for this morning and I'll be happy to uh, take questions um, and you can always email questions as well to my email at miguel.cervantes at um, But I did want to open it back up for our um, discussion and, and take some time to see if any of y'all have any questions or, or Dr. Berger, and I don't know if there's anything you would like to add before I open it up for questions. No, I think that was succinct and to the point. And, and I think that uh, now uh, the rest of our discussion should be driven by people's questions and need to know. So uh, we can field those together. Miguel did a great job. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the screen unless Miguel, you want to do that, but where on your website, it shows where people can go. Uh, that's always really helpful to actually see that. So um, do you want to do that or I will? Okay. You can do that. I am pulling, okay, I am thanks. pulling it up. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, I have my beautiful. I do have a question uh, for Ruth. Reflecting back on um, that gathering with the White House, uh, what was your main takeaway from that, that um, our community and faith leaders might need to hear from your vantage point and what yeah. you heard that day. So uh, from my vantage point, I, I heard um, something that was a little concerning about Bear County kind of having some uh, larger numbers per population basis um, compared to the you know per population numbers across the country. That bothered me <laughs> since I'm an infectious disease doctor and I don't wanna hear anything about anything about Bear County being any worse than anywhere else. Um, but it did make me wanna understand uh, what we can do to uh, get the spotlight taken off of us. <laughs> um, you know, they weren't overly uh, upset about hot, they didn't call these, uh, this a hot spot, they called it a warm spot and acknowledged that the big picture is really that rates are coming down across the country. But if we, we'd like this to go away altogether and the way to do that is to vaccinate. Um, I, I heard that um, some of the barriers to getting vaccine are people feel shame, uh, people feel stigmatized and there was generally a call to try to make it just a practical, pragmatic thing that, you know, if you're somebody who may be at risk for MPOX because of behavioral things that you engage in, there are ways to reduce your risk. And without shaming those people um, or condescendingly educating them, uh, we can just simply make it clear that this is a way of an, another thing that can be done to take care of your health and the health of those around you by going to get vaccinated. And um, I was hoping that we'd see a little bit more diversification of the venues where vaccination can take place um, because right now the vaccination is largely taking place in HIV clinics or clinics that primarily take care of people with HIV. And there are some folks who don't have HIV and they may not feel comfortable going into a clinic that is known to be a place where people get their HIV taken care of. So for that, there is a San Antonio Metro Health's um, office. So there is one venue in San Antonio. And if you go to the website, um, which is nationally available, I guess it's mpoxvaxmap.org, mpoxvaxmap.org. As of today, three places come up. Um, and those are Highland Boulevard, which is Metro Health, clinic, which is not an HIV clinic, um, the U University Health Systems Facts Clinic, which is on West Martin, and then the Kind Clinic, which is on Isom Road. Those are the three that come up. But I think Miguel said that there are uh, six HIV provider organizations that are also offering. So there are probably more places to get vaccinated than the three that come up on this MPOX vaccine locator, which I think Anne has kindly put Nope, Miguel's for. busy doing that. That's Miguel. He's that, he, yeah, he's that public health administrator. He's administrating the, the, the site because this is really important information, not only where to find it, you know, online, but like where to drive to. And just having that, if you could even go in further on that, Miguel, I'm sure people would appreciate it. Um, just knowing that 
in our, our brain matter could be really helpful in one of those conversations that you're not planning, right? You run into somebody and you, you just know where these are at. So um, can I jump in and say that another really important point to make for everybody is that nobody has to be explicit about why they're at risk. That's a really key part of fighting this um, disease. If somebody show, calls and says, I'm at risk and I want the monkeypox vaccine, that is enough. They will not get interrogated. Um, and so people who may be counseling others about this, that's a useful thing to remind them of. They're not gonna go and get shamed or have invasive questions asked of them just because they're identifying as needing this vaccine. Mm -hmm. And thanks for saying that, Dr. Bergen, because that did remind me that um, on Metro Health's website, we do have some uh, criteria posted uh, for those that are eligible. Now, uh, keep in mind, we are loosely using this criteria because if people are coming in and saying that they're, they feel that they're at risk for monkeypox, we'll go ahead and administer the vaccine. Uh, but the reason why we do have this prioritization is because um, even though we, we do have enough supply of vaccine uh, to administer to the, the individuals who would need it or, or would like to receive it, we don't have enough vaccine to administer the entire community. Um, so we, we did want to make sure that um, people understood that this current outbreak, um, th there are some priority group prioritization that we had to do because early on we did have a, a limited supply of vaccine. Um, and, and so we did have to use that judiciously, but now we do have uh, enough vaccine available for the individuals who would like to receive it. So uh, someone did ask in the chat, but I'm thinking that was just answered. What makes someone eligible to receive the MPOX vaccine? And um, I think we've, that's been answered. Um, Ruth and Miguel, if if there's something that hasn't been mentioned already in terms of like faith, community, leaders that are in community, um, how, how can, along with having this information, how can we best help in this particular situation? Is there anything else that could be done? Well, I, I would um, offer that uh, having an informational sheet that's pretty simple, available. I mean, most um, places of worship have areas where there's community resources and information available. And um, having that information available for people is useful. Um, I'm a member of Health Confianza, which is a SA Metro Health partner as well. So technically Miguel's part of Health Confianza, um, and which is a COVID-19 focused health literacy promoting effort to try to get better health outcomes equitably uh, from COVID. But at our, co our Health Confianza events, of which we have numerous kinds, um, we have been putting out a flyer and we've got one in Spanish and one in English. And you know what? People take the flyer. So it, that's sort of passive way of making information available, but it's not just because it's passive on our part doesn't mean it's useless on the part of the recipient. People would not be taking this flyer off of our tables if there weren't a need to know and a, and a request for information. So that's a no brainer. Um, mm -hmm. Whether or not uh, a particular faith leader wants to take it beyond just putting it out there and inserting it into a mailing of a newsletter, you know, that's, of course, completely dependent on um, your comfort level and, and your congregation. Uh, we don't want to scare people about this. And the vast majority of cases have been in the population of men who have sex with men. But I agree and want to underline what Miguel said, that this is not about um, gender or sexual orientation as much as it is about behavioral risk factors. The problem is that you can have these lesions on your extremities, you know, on your hands, and that's how uh, transmission could occur in a manner that's completely non-sexual. And the very vulnerable include neonates, newborns, um, people who have skin problems like eczema. So if there's someone in a household 
um, share, sharing a household with other people. And if those other people have uh, conditions that make them vulnerable, then you know, non-sexual transmission can certainly happen. Mm. Uh, question in chat, is there an intentional effort to start using the term MPOX instead of monkeypox as that term itself can add to the hesitancy? Yeah, Miguel, you wanna feel that? I see you nodding. Sure, so th there is um, a, a big effort in trying to change um, the name to MPOX because that, that's caused not only um, some issues in, in terms of misunderstanding what the condition is and where it comes from, uh, but then also caused some barriers as well in people coming to get care. A, a lot of people, um, th there's been other countries in the world where, where they thought it was coming from uh, monkeys, uh, which is not really known. Uh, so they, they were killing off large animal packs. Um, and, and then there's also uh, the stigma-based uh, aspect of it. So we are trying to use MPOX for it um, so that uh, it helps reduce the stigma and uh, create a better understanding um, and prevent that from being a barrier from people trying to learn about the, the virus itself. Um, it's 8.29. And I'm gonna just take a pause for a minute. Um, Miguel or Ruth, if you're able to stay on for an extra, I don't know, five to 10 minutes, um, we might continue with some questions. In fact, I think folks would probably, and I'm going to mispronounce this, but might wanna even hear more Ruth about health. The group that came together, you say the word so well, Confianza. say it. Yeah, they might wanna hear more about that. So kind of be ready for that, but it's 8.29 and we try to do most of the briefing, the, the main points between uh, eight and 8.30 and compassionate respect for everybody's day. And I know some people need to leave to get onto meetings. We also do this on city council day because it's important. And sometimes we have civic leaders, uh, city leaders who are with us. And so it just kind of highlights the importance of of the work that we are doing together at the intersection. So for those who do need to leave at this point, thanks for being with us today. Next week, we're going to be hearing from our city manager, Eric Walsh. Um, the city has received an award, a national award, and I want everyone to hear about it. Um, and my supervisor, Mel Woolsey, will also be with Eric. And uh, both of them are going to be talking about the strides that uh, our city staff have taken in terms of compassionate care and human service across the city. And um, so I think it's important we hear that. The last Thursday of the month, it could well be the last public view with uh, Nelson Wolf. Uh, his last day as county judge is December 31st. He, whether you know it or not, you'll probably be hearing some of that, but at least over my last 30 years of doing the work, his, he has been very instrumental um, in the work that we're doing, whether you know it or not. So uh, I think that's going to be just a lovely, wonderful way to finish the year. Um, so I hope you will join us in the next couple of weeks as well. So if you need to leave, thanks for being with us. So let's go back a little bit to the conversation. Um, does anybody else have questions about MPOX or thoughts uh, from our attendees or any more thoughts from Miguel or Ruth? And then I'd like to go on to just hear a little bit about this other group that formed with COVID. Okay. Help, uh, Ruth, Miguel, tell us a little bit about this group. So um, Health Confianza is the name of our project, which we hope will go long past COVID. Um, the name of it itself is intentionally bilingual. So you have the word health in English and the word confianza in Spanish. Um, and confianza means trust or confidence. And our real goal is to um, improve the relationship of trust between our public and health delivery services. Health professions in general have taken a hit, if I may say so, with regard to trust uh, from the community. So we want to heal that trust in order to be able to make information and services available to people so that they get what they need when they need it um, in order to be as healthy as they possibly can be. 
All right, so I gave you a modified version of the definition of the term health literacy. It's a technical term. We don't like it too much because when we throw it around a lot, it makes people feel like we're accusing somebody somewhere of being illiterate, which is not the case. Uh, in fact, we're focusing more on organizational health literacy, which is the degree to which an institution or an organization equitably makes health information and services accessible and usable uh, for people who need it. So um, in, after COVID happened, there was a lot of need for health communication. The Department of Health and Human Services through the Office of Minority Health put out a request for applications. So we got this funding. Um, several millions of dollars that were uh, came to the city of San Antonio, which then works with both UTSA and UT Health in order to make good things happen. And so what those things are is of relevance to faith leaders because we could come and partner with you if you're interested. Um, what we offer ranges from ambassador trainings, which if somebody wants to be a health ambassador, uh, we bring them in for uh, half a day or a couple hours training session and then provide them with tools and information and feedback and follow up. And so we've done this in high schools. Uh, we've done this in places like the YWCA. Uh, we've done this in, we're, we're getting ready to do it in the libraries, which is so exciting to me. I think that libraries are a great place for health information to be shared. And not all of the places are health specific. Um, we, for those that are interested, we offer the opportunity to create a community health club. And a community health club is a group of people who are led by a facilitator. The facilitator is usually someone who reflects the demographics of that group, someone who is a near peer, but who's had some special training. And the facilitator leads the club of individuals through a series of um, modular learning experiences, which are meant to be fun, engaging, um, and will hopefully result in people having deeper understanding about health issues. Right now it's COVID specific, but you know, it can expand to other issues down the line. Um, and then that after a series of about 10 club meetings over a period of several months, there's usually a culminating event with uh, public recognition for the participants. And I love this part. It's very community affirming, community making. Um, we just heard in detail about a club graduation at uh, Fuerza Unida, which is an organization um, that advocates for laborers that used to work for Levi Strauss and then Levi Strauss shut down and a lot of people were terminated apparently unfairly, but there's a, a residual activist group that, um, that exists on the West side and there are youth there. So um, about between 17 to 20 people completed this health club series. They had a big graduation ceremony um, with a cake and balloons and um, people gave testimonials and talked about what they learned. And so the, the public recognition of the young people who went through this club experience uh, was very powerful. Um, we've got pictures of kids with blue hair getting a blessing um, from a, uh, a clergy member who, who came and had a special blessing for each kid. So there's so many things that can happen kind of spontaneously and naturally within the culture of a community or the culture of an organization that are, are healing. And so what we hope then is that not only will these youth uh, bear the message about COVID and getting vaccinated and why it's helpful, and now they have an ability to, to do some myth busting as well, we hope that this will extend further into um, kind of a virtuous social cycle, if you will, where there are people in community who care about the health of others in community um, and that there is a stronger relationship between the community and the health providing organizations. So that's a big picture of Health Confianza. We've had some seed grants. I think I saw Ms. Beverly Watts Davis on this call. Uh, and Ms. Oh, Beverly- Oh yeah, she's here. here. Um, so we have just, uh, been talking with Beverly Watts Davis and West Care about um, having some of our uh, health confianza funding allocated for activities that will promote vaccination 
um, in the West Care population in what uh, Ms. Watts Davis calls the Near East Side, which is a community where we really do need to do a lot of healing work and building of confianza between the, the community and people who provide health and health information. If someone were interested in knowing more, being a part of it, connecting in any way, how would they go about doing that? We do have a website and I think you can just type in um, healthconfianza.org. Um, you may email me personally and I will put my email in the chat. Um, if you were to do that, um, I will connect you immediately to uh, Ms. Mia Vento, who's our project manager, and that would um, gain access to a whole lot of things. We can come and do a town hall um, with people in your faith community. Uh, we can come and do ambassador trainings. Uh, we can, if there's interest, uh, we can help you uh, and build a community health club. Uh, we are not giving out any more seed grants right now because um, thankfully we found a bunch of orgs that have done it. But there's another uh, resource, which is to become part of a learning collaborative. And that would be something for, for you know, the future uh, where people who are not health delivery organizations can work on making their organization more health literate, meaning actually proactively helping people find use and understand health information and services. Um, so being part of a learning collaborative for health literacy is an opportunity as well. So I'll put my email in the chat. Um, you know what I've noticed by listening carefully, and this just uh, gives me so much hope, but just listening carefully, Ruth, to what you are describing and how it works, we have come a long way <laughs> in, in how we go about doing the work, right? To hear um, you mention about the near peer, somebody who represents the community. Mm -hmm. I think our model before that, our working larger model was, you know, you bring in the expert and then the expert, or you bring in a program and you tell people what to do type of thing. But this whole, you know, being in community and having, you know, someone in that community, the near peer who has some of that information, but that's a huge step in, in a healing process that we've learned collectively on a very large scale with research behind it, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it just gives me so much hope. And it's a lot of how at the intersection is based. You know, the nearer to the ground of the needs that we all can be working together and the closer in proximity to where those things are happening. So the larger we grow geographically, in one sense, the smaller we need to work. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I'm gonna share with you something really fascinating. So we had these community health clubs in Burkina Faso in West Africa, and they're, they're still kind of going on. Um, a lot of the people who came were women and we were doing, our subject area was water sanitation and hygiene, it's basically hand washing to prevent disease. And when we got to the end of that um, big graduation ceremony, we went through a process that all the health clubs are supposed to do, which is to learn from this club, what do they want to do next? What do they know? What are their assets that they have? What can they do with their hands? And what do they care about with their heart, hands, head, and heart? And these women in Burkina Faso, after doing the wash business, they said, you know what? We need to learn how to read. <laughs> so reading per se is not something a doctor would prescribe, right? It's not a prescription. But we do know that when women are educated in in resource limited settings that everybody's health improves. Um, and guess what Fuerza Unida said after the graduation ceremony. So you know that people in San Antonio can read. It wasn't about reading. You know what? They needed computer literacy because they have this collective of seamstresses that are working and generating income because um, that's what they know how to do, right? And so they were real happy to host us and have a youth 
um, club that was focused on COVID-19, but when, when they kind of went through a modified version of head, heart, hands, they said, we need to be able to digitize our work and, and be able to use these uh, digital tools that we're not so good at. And I thought it was fascinating. I, because I see, I see extreme similarities between what was driving the request of the women in Burkina Faso uh, with these women in, in San Antonio, um, which is you know, being able to have tools through their education to, to better themselves in their communities. So we, we know that when, when we make lives better for the women of Fuerza Unida, um, when they're more successful in their enterprise, that is going to lift up the health of the community. But you, you have to really listen closely as, as Anne uh, reminds us. Hmm. Did you know you were going to be bringing in a message of inspiration this morning, Ruth? But you did. I, uh, that, that all just gives me so much hope. And in fact, it also, it's like a flashback because I was in 4-H as a child, you know, hand, heart, um, head and health, the four leaf clover, and it's still there, whether we call it 4-H or not. Um, I've watched a series on, uh, so I know not everybody has Apple plus TV, but there's a series. It's, it's be beautiful uh, called home. And it's not about house flipping, but it is about creating houses and homes. It's just amazing. But there was one um, uh, one of the programs and it was in Chicago and how a community through building and working much exactly what we're talking about, but then uh, also showed itself in their buildings and in, in literal structures, beautiful. But so one of my newest favorite quotes is from a reverend that was on that in that series, Reverend Wilson from Chicago. And she said, yeah, gotta be proximate to the problem, to the need to change it. And that is not rocket science, but it is human science. And um, I'm grateful that, uh, I'm grateful that the White House called, that they had no idea where this might lead San Antonio, but I'm grateful. And I'm grateful to, to Ruth and Miguel this morning. Thank you for spending 45 minutes of your valuable lives with us, investing in our community here in San Antonio. We're grateful. I wanna wish everyone a beautiful weekend. It's gorgeous here in San Antonio. I don't know where Ruth is because she spends her life in two places on this country's map. So I hope everyone has beautiful weekends. Uh, we get a day closer every day to uh, the new year and hopefully everybody gets a little rest and relaxation between now and that new year along the way. Everyone take care of yourself and those you love and we'll talk soon. Thanks so much and thank you Miguel for your excellent yeah. presentation. See thank you, you next so week. Much. We'll see you. Miguel you, and Ruth you can come every week if you want. <laughs> thank you. It's good stuff. Thanks. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye. And please please respond to something in the chat that I said. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I just need a delivery address for you. It's all it's a river at the bottom. Oh. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh one five five. Need something where that you're comfortable with. I just didn't know. I can where I'll put it in chat. Okay, thank you. Beverly wants a, an address for me, so I'll put that in chat just to her. Although, you know, I could put it in chat for everybody and people could bring me gifts over the season and that wouldn't hurt me so much. <laughs> uh, but this year has been a wonderful year of just of exploration of information of empowerment through knowledge. I, I constantly tell my these young people, you guys, knowledge is power, but you don't really sometimes realize that until you get older. And mm -hmm. then you realize, golly, you know, sometimes it just takes a little, you know, seasoning in life for you to realize that really information is power and, and all the things along that pathway, along your life journey, um, 
add up. And I believe God puts them in your way. You don't realize sometimes when the, when the information is coming to you, how important it is until something happens and you go, ah, oh my gosh, I remember when I was on the intersection and they said such and such. We just did mm. this with the safety thing that you told us about. Staff mm. got real excited and they followed up on it. So thank you. Well, and I'm going to say it, although they didn't want me to necessarily say it yesterday, but we at least quadrupled the attendance from um, the faith and the community yesterday at that symposium from a year ago, easily. And um, yeah, so it was good, even at a time of year, that's not easy for people to do such things. No, and so there and they all came back just mm -hmm. <laughs> it's important information, but I have to tell you this whole thing about education. So now we're having, you know, the the parking lot conversation here, right? The conversation after the conversation. But um, I have been participating, and I mentioned this before, but I've been participating in a second round of what's called pro social. Um, it's I'm not going to go into all the training. The part of the story I want to tell you that it's it's a global training that I'm in virtual, but there's this one young man whose name is Ben and not the Ben that some of us know, uh, Ben. And I think he's from one of the Carolinas, if I remember correctly. But early on in this 10-week training, um, he was asking like the most important crazy good questions of anyone in the training. And after about the third time he did this, right? I put into chat, who is this Ben who asked these questions? Who is this guy, you know? To find out he's 21 years old. And he already knows that value of education and critical thinking, and he is busy and on it. And I'm telling you, you know, those are the people I look for. They give me so much hope. The stuff I've learned, most of what I consider like the really rich, important things all happened after I turned 40. And it just keeps happening, right? It keeps building. If I had been Ben at 21, right? If I had like been in that state that he's in and he's in it and he's not alone. And I know that. Um, and we all know that some of the greatest global movements have come like out of college campuses, out of 20 year olds. Whew, I just, I'm get, I, I, my hair is standing up in my arms. I just get so excited about that hope, that drive. And uh, I'm crazy about Ben. I just, I, he just, and he's just so alive, you know? Anything can happen with Ben. And uh, he lives in a world of abundance in a time that's kind of, you know, confusing. Is he in San Antonio? No, he's in one of the Carolinas. I think if I remember correctly. And uh, he's also, he he's not in college, he's self-didactic. And, uh, you know, so he's learned most of what, he, and he knows a lot. And he's, he's just, he's probably, you know, one of those wonder childs as well, but he's accepted in uh, really big circles of like science and neuroscience. He's, yeah, he's smart. But he's just so unassuming and and fun. I just, ugh, who is this Ben? I may have Ben come just because it would, you know, tell you the intersection. That's a good idea. I may do that for um, our storytelling series in January and maybe partner him with Beverly Watts Davis. Hey. Love that. Yeah, you've never met before. You don't know anything about each other. Of course, the series is supposed to be unlikely San Antonians, but we could make him a San Antonian for a day. He could be an honorary San Antonio for the day. Right, yeah, right. Okay.
Okay, so we're going to work on that, Beverly. We're going to work on that. We've got three of the four Thursdays taken care of now. So I'm working it. So anyway, I do have to go. And you probably do too. So thanks for being here.